So if we come back over here, you can see our washing rules right here in blue. You see that we have to have paper towel to turn the faucet on. We're only gonna use warm water. We're going to check the water temperature and then allow the patient to check it. Whatever we wash, we rinse, we dry. Don't get the surface wet. And we talked about that on Monday, actually. Uh, warm the lotion before use and apply, uh, and then wipe off the excess. So we now know the washing rules and we're gonna put these in use for hand and nail care. Now, anytime we have washing, that means we have a basin that holds water, right? Because you have to have that for washing. So anytime we're washing, we also have basin cleaning. So these two actually go together. Sometimes you'll have basin cleaning without washing, like with mouth care, but anytime you have washing, you always have basin cleaning as well. So these two tend to go together. So as of right now, we know almost all, all but two, of the principles that we have to learn. So see how easy that was? No stress, right? No stress. We always have to always, always, always start with the care plan. So let's go to that page. All right, so hand and nail care. For those of you who wanna play along in your book, it's on page 82. So this care plan says provide hand and nail care to one hand, just one. The patient is sitting in a chair at the bedside and can move as directed. So they can move. You can ask them to put their hand in the basin. You can ask them to move their hand. This is saying that they're not incapacitated. You can ask them to participate in the skill. But it says perform hand and nail care to one hand. Now I know the patient has two. We don't care why we're not doing the other hand. That, that We don't care. It has no bearing on us at all. For the test, you get to pick which hand. In a clinical setting, it would actually say right hand or left hand. For the test, this is just a time-saving issue. If they watch you wash one hand, rinse one hand, dry one hand, clean under the nails, file them in one direction, and lotion one hand, they don't need to see it on the other side. They know you've got it. But pay attention, it says one hand. If you try to do two hands on the test, you will fail because you did not follow the care plan. I know you think you went above and beyond and you're showing off and you know trying to, to impress the evaluators, but they're not impressed because you did not follow the care plan. But if you look at the supplies on this page, you'll see that there are a whole lot of supplies, whole lot of supplies. But try to make them make sense to you. Remember, anytime we use supplies, we need a barrier for the table first. It's a washing skill, so that always involves basin and soap. You also need washcloths and a towel. And I'll tell you a little secret. If you're washing a small body part for the test, like one hand or one foot, you need two washcloths. Everything else takes four. So hand care and foot care, two washcloths, everything else takes four. But we also need an orange wood stick to clean under the nails. We need an emery board to file the rough edges, and then we need lotion to apply lotion. So even though it looks like a whole lot of supplies there, try to make them make sense. And again, here you can see all of the different uh, steps that are involved in this. If you have the book with you while you're performing the steps, it makes it a little bit easier. Down at the bottom of the page, you will see test-specific information. For someone with your level of experience, you should be able to complete this skill in 11 minutes or less. This skill is going to be performed on another testing student. So someone just like you that's there to test, and you may be a patient for this skill for somebody else that's testing. The patient will be positioned in a chair at the side of the bed before the skill begins, and this is something the evaluator does. They're going to set the scene by making sure the patient is sitting in a chair at the side of the bed before the skill begins. And charting is not required for this skill for the exam. But I want to talk to you about nail files. Now, nail clippers, so, um, you know, like things, fingernail clippers, we can't use those as CNAs. That uh, has to be a nursing function. And that's because it's super easy to accidentally cut the skin. And if your patient is diabetic, that can lead to a wound that doesn't heal. But if you file somebody's nails often, routinely, 
like once or twice a week. That's preventative maintenance. You never have to clip their nails because they never grow long. You're keeping them short just by filing them on a regular basis. But Filing an elderly person's nails is different than filing a younger person's nails because as we age, our nails get brittle. We lose a lot of collagen, which keeps things pliable. And when the nails become brittle, they tend to break down the middle. So they'll split right down the middle and fall off, kind of like ladybug wings. And they'll just open up. And it's very, very painful for patients. And the way this happens is if you take an emery board and you file like you would file your your own nails right you go back and forth really rapidly across the surface of the nail what that does is it pulls the nail this way and then it pulls it this way and the point of maximum impact is right down the middle because you're pushing in both directions and if you do that rapidly if you go really fast just like that it can actually split that nail up the middle so when you're filing nails you need to file, especially in older patients, don't go back and forth rapidly. You wanna file in one direction toward the middle. Just like that, okay? So filing nails is a little different than what you would do for yourself. When you're cleaning with an orange stick, which you're gonna see in the video in just a minute, we're gonna use the slanted end of the orange stick, kind of as a scoop, just go under the nails, circle around, and then you have to wipe that off before you go to the next nail. Remember, you don't wanna transfer contaminants from one nail to another. So we're gonna clean under the nail, wipe it off, go to the next nail, clean under, wipe it off, go to the next nail, clean under, and then you will file the nails in one direction toward the center with the emery board, okay? Then apply lotion, warm it up first, and then wipe off the excess. And then it's just a matter of cleaning up like we clean up for everything. Now, for the test, you do not need to wear gloves for this skill because your patient, we're not going to touch any body fluids, right? There's no body fluids on the hands. Uh, not for this patient. We aren't touching any personal skin. And this patient for the test, you know, that's you. Remember that you are going to be a patient for this if, if your partner gets a skill. So, you know, you don't have any um, non-intact skin on your hands. But let's say just for illustration purposes, that you get assigned to do this skill and your partner, the other testing student, has a huge rash on their hands. Maybe they're allergic to latex and they didn't know it and it broke their hands out and they've got this huge red scaly weepy rash on their hand. Would you need gloves to perform hand and nail care for the test on that patient? What do you think? That is correct, yes. So it's not based on the skill. Remember, it's always based on the patient we're doing that skill on. Remember on Monday, I told you that the evaluators check you in and then they leave the room for 15 or 20 minutes. And what they were doing was very, very important. So you guys remember that? Well, when they come back in and they divide you up into groups of two, these are the things that they took into consideration when they decided who your partner was going to be. So let's say that you're the one that has the big scaly rash on their hands. You are not going to be a patient for range of motion, for hand and nail care, for uh, anything that has to do with your hands, uh, transferring, because we don't want your hands up near somebody's face. So they actually look at things like that. Um, and if anybody has those skills, you're not gonna be a patient for them. But you could be a patient for um, something that doesn't involve the hands, something like mouth care, sideline position, making an occupied bed. Those things you could be a, a good patient for, uh, feeding, those types of things. So they look at what you have going on and figure out who you would be a good patient for somebody else doing their skill set. So you need to understand that when they're gone for those 20 minutes, they're looking at a lot of different things. They're also gonna be asking you, when you check in, they'll ask you, do you have any conditions that would prevent you from being a patient for any of these skills? So let's say you just had a root canal done you don't want somebody in your mouth because if they irritate that suture, you might start bleeding. And that would freak out the person that's testing you, right? That, that's uh, performing the skill. If you all of a sudden started bleeding, that would be horrible. So 
you want to tell them, I just had a root canal, I've got, you know, some stitches, or I just had an extraction, or, you know, whatever's going on with you. If you have a horrible case of ringworm on your foot, you need to let them know, hey, I've got an ingrown toenail, I've got ringworm, I've got something going on, because we don't want to use that foot for foot care. Okay, we might be able to use the other one, possibly, but we're probably just going to keep you off the list for foot care and make you a patient for somebody who doesn't have foot care instead. So you need to be truthful with them when they ask you, do you have any conditions? Let them know what's going on with you. Um, that way they can make sure everybody has the right testing experience. Any questions on that? Well, no, you actually want to soak the hand and wash it first because if you try to remove the debris before, you know, without soaking the hands, soaking the hands actually softens that debris and makes it easier to remove. So by soaking the hands first, it actually makes it easier. So soaking the hand and then washing it is fine and then removing the debris, that, that's fine. There, there's no problem with that. If you have somebody who has a lot of debris, let's say I've got somebody who maybe has been homeless for the last few months and I'm doing it, they're now in a facility, I'm doing hand and nail care. In that case, what I would probably do is wash their hand, you know, soak it, wash it, rinse it, dry it. I would clean under the nails and then file the rough edges, but I know there's a lot of filing, so there's a lot of debris, there's a lot of crusty stuff under the nails because let's face it, they've been homeless. I would probably get another, you know, clean the basin out, get another basin of clean water and wash the hands again after uh, cleaning under the nails and uh, filing the rough edges. And then that would just give that, that little bit of extra cleaning. It really depends on what's going on with the patient. But for general principles, no, just washing it, rinsing it, drying it, cleaning the nails, filing it, and then lotioning is fine. You always, always, always have to check with the nurse. That's the answer to everything. And I can't give you one answer that's gonna fit every situation that you come up with because there are some lotions that will uh, react with certain medications or uh, we're getting ready to do a test on a patient later on today that's affected by lotions and powders and deodorants. So I can't give you one answer. 90% of the time, the answer is going to be, yeah, go ahead, use whatever they got. But I can't, that won't, that won't work across the board. You always have to check with the nurse because the nurse knows what's going on with that patient better than anybody.